talking about the Milky Way and then my postdoc Ekaterina Karukis. She's going to talk a little bit about dwarf steroidal galaxies because she's an expert on uh, uh, dwarf galaxies. So, uh, okay. The reason why many of you might be interested in, in this class is because you've been going through direct and indirect detection, okay? So you know that if you want to look for indirect detection or direct detection, you're interested in knowing how much dark matter there is around, either in the target or in the case of direct detection, the target is downstairs, so around us, okay? So the rationale for indirect detection is this. You really care about the dark matter distribution in the target, so every time you choose a target, you want to know how much dark matter and what's the density inside there because your observed expected flux is dependent on the integral. And this is something that I went through the last class of last week. And uh, so this is a little bit the sketch. Well, this is the expected flux. It's not the flux you're going to see. It's the flux that you expect to see given certain observables. But the important thing is that it will always be dependent on something which is typically characteristic of the target where you are and on the distance from the target at more or less it's easier to measure okay likewise if you want to see some scattering of, of something into your detector in direct detection at earth okay so this is the, sch the scheme so what you're gonna see in your detector and everything you're learning today is that you're gonna see something in your detector and then maybe if you're good enough you get away the noise and you know that that's a, a signal from dark matter Fair enough. But then how to interpret that signal in terms of the real dark matter parameters, it depends on your expected rate, and your expected rate will depend on all the characteristic of the detector, on the scattering cross-section and the mass that you are looking for, and the dark matter density around you and the velocity structure. Okay? So if you want to know these and you observe these, you have to know this stuff, the dark matter density around you. Of course, this is a generic motivation in particle physics term, but personally, I'm interested in how much dark matter there is around the Milky Way just because the Milky Way is my home galaxy. Or other targets, I might be interested in that because there is one mo more motivation. The exact distribution of dark matter is something that comes out of the cosmological model. Okay? Not the exact one, but the, 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 the details of the formation of the structure come out of the cosmological model. So knowing how dark matter is distributed inside the galaxies also gives you an information about how consistent is this cosmological model with dark matter. Okay? So, but let alone the motivations, let's just say that I want to learn about the dark matter distribution around the Earth because we are interested in direct detection. Let's start easy. Okay? And so, we are around here, and there's two possible ways to learn about the dark matter distribution only around here, okay? One, I give an example. I give an example using the genes equations in one of the first two classes. Ex at least the examples are on the slides. And forget about the rest of the galaxy. It's very local, okay? So you, you measure the motion, the vertical motion of the stars around us, so a very small volume, 100 parsec, you can measure the peculiar velocity of the stars. You are picking stars that you know are have a motion which is up and down and no other motion, so there is no shear, etc. At that point, you write down the Gene's equations. And the Gene's equations are relating the density with the gravitational potential. Katia is going to give an example in another geometry. But fundamentally, is a you're not making any assumption about dark matter or nothing. You're just relating through the Boltzmann equation in presence of gravitational potential, which becomes the Gene's equation, the velocity distribution F, V, and R, or its integral, which is going to give you the density, to observable such as the local density of stars, so this is the total, the the density of stars and the velocity of stars, the traces, okay? But this I don't want to get into because the way you're going to get information only close to the small volume and then you have to get rid of the density of stars. So Katia is going to give an example in which one thing are the observables, the stars, but their gravitational potential is negligible. So that's the case of the dwarf spheroidal. So you have one ideal observable and it traces something completely different, which is the total gravitational potential. So 
There is one way, so one way to get the information about the local dark matter density is this one. And it th the good thing is it doesn't make any assumption about what the shape of the potential is, right? It's only local, you're determining the, the local potential. I'm not assuming that the dark matter distribution in the galaxy has any shape. Not doing it, okay? I don't want to get into the details of the genes equation, but you don't have to rely on any assumption, okay? On the other hand, but then you're limited to the knowledge only in this area, okay? Close to us. But if I'm interested in knowing the dark matter distribution in the whole galaxy, and that's the interesting part that you might be interested in, the whole galaxy, then it comes to the point that I have, and I will show you why I have to do it, okay? To assume a shape for the dark matter distribution in the whole galaxy. So first of all, let me mention one thing. You do expect from first principles that the dark matter in the galaxy is distributed almost spherically. Okay? So zero order principles, you might be tempted to say any shape, but fundamentally only one dependence is the radius. It doesn't have dependence on t and f uh, theta and phi. And the reason is that since dark matter is non-dissipative, non and neither is collisional, if it starts with a distribution which is more or less spherical, which is what you expect in the early universe because it's homogeneous and isotropic besides some small fluctuations, so the fluctuations are spherical, gravity is spherical, the original distribution is spherical. Then what happens? The gas gets rid of its own energy, so it collapses. It really cannot give, uh, get rid of the angular momentum. So if you write down the equations which are not trivial, you find that the way to lose energy but not angular momentum gives you a disk. But dark matter doesn't lose neither energy nor angular momentum, so if it had a spherical distribution, it maintains a spherical distribution. This is not true at the level of 20% maybe, or, or 10%, but at the leading order it's true. Okay? And in fact, if you go to simulations, when you, when you simulate the equation, well, when you solve the equations of the collapse of dark matter, you find almost spherical profiles. And now many of you might be familiar with this name, NFW. So NFW is just, it means Navarro, Frank, and White. And what happened? So people look into simulations, okay? And you have a sphere of dark matter inside the simulation, and you say, good, what's the density profile? You count the particles, and you come out with a density profile. So just take the density, and you have the radius. And this famous NFW profile is nothing else than what they found is that this thing is basically a broken power law. Okay? So you have that the distribution of dark matter is, first of all, spherical. And second, it basically resembles a power law. So you have R, so you have something like this. Let's put it this way. Okay? So you have an important thing, which is the normalization, how tall this thing is. Another thing, which is the breaking point, where the power law breaks. Okay? And then you have the index of this power law and the index of this power law. So you can basically write a function, which is a function of the radius, of course, and then of four parameters, the normalization, the breaking point, and then two indexes. The interesting thing is that in a pure Navarro, Frank, and White, this second index is always fixed, is basically always the same, and they typically also fix also the first index. Okay? So this thing, the dark matter distribution, becomes nothing else than a power law with a normalization and an index. That's it. And and the breaking point. Uh, no, the, the index is fixed, so you have a breaking point. There is an index, but the index is fixed. Okay? If you want to be a little more generic and allow some for some freedom, you might imagine to allow this index to vary. So it's not a fixed thing, but so you have three parameters. Okay? 
Now, why am I saying all this? Because when I go to the real data and the real galaxy and I want to interpret the observations, I have to use a shape. In principle, I could not, but in practice, I have to. And I can show you why in principle I can and in practice I cannot. But so, is it clear that now I need a shape and the shape is spherical? Yes. No, I'm not choosing it yet. This second parameter here is taken from the simulation and it turns out to be the same. So, one important thing. This uh, double power law, broken power law shape, this was the important thing about NFW. I mean, now people have, uh, ah, NFW, NFW. They, there was a reason. The reason was that you find that this shape is basically the same if you range from small dwarf galaxies to galaxy clusters. The normalization changes, but somehow the scale radius, it's called the breaking point, stays constant with respect to the size of the halo. So it was an invariant over several orders of magnitude. This thing keeps being true at the leading order. It's not true at 100%, but it keeps being true. So they were saying, look, there is something fundamentally physical in the fact that if I look at very small scales or at very big scales, I always have the same shape. Okay? Obviously, this is not entirely true. And people have been debating that for 20 years. But for what interests us is that this is a very well-posed shape. And the second index is the same basically everywhere. It's minus 2 because... And this thing is more or less the same in all simulations. And uh, there is this far is a is a cusp or is is something like this or is it something like this? You might have heard about the core cusp problem and all these things. I think it's fake today because when you go in simulations, you also see that this thing wobbles. Okay, but for the moment, let's not care about it. Let's say that I leave, I I keep only one index, one power law index, and it's the one internal. Okay, so I don't fix it. I have a function, which is a function of the radius, and it has three free parameters. The index, the breaking point, which really doesn't matter, it doesn't change things a lot, and the normalization, okay? And then, since I'm going to go to the Milky Way, let's agree on something. The normalization just shifts this thing up and down, okay? So many of you are theorists, it doesn't really matter where I define this normalization, so I can just define the normalization where I am. So fixing the radius at the radius of the sun. I, one is equivalent to the other. So what I do is I just call this one the density at where I am. So it's convenient because when I do direct detection, this is my parameter directly. I don't have to reconstruct it. But it's just a normalization. Okay? Now I go to the Milky Way. Okay? I'm using this shape and I have three parameters that I want to fix. And to be honest, at the leading order, I can even neglect this one. I can take, I, I, I fix a certain scale because from the simulations it's more or less 20 kilobars, I put it. But anyways, I can, I can leave the three parameters free. What's going on? Now, what I'm getting is the rotation curve, observe rotation curve, and the rotation curve from the stars. Now, let me be clear. There is nothing really special about the rotation curve. The rotation curve is convenient because it's sitting in a plane, so it's reconstructing the relationship between the density or the gravitational potential and the rotation curve. It's easy. But the rotation curve is just one way to measure the potential. Okay? So what I want to do is that I want to, on one hand, I want to measure the total mass or the total gravitational potential. And on the other hand, I want to measure the visible mass or, if you want, the density of stars. In the case of our galaxy, the stars are the, m the biggest component of visible. The gas is negligible, okay? So when I go to the Milky Way, the, the thing that I measure, to m the tracer of the total gravitational potential is the rotation curve, okay? And the thing that I measure, that I obtain to measure the visible mass is the photometer of the stars. Then, whether I am comparing this, so this one I just mo measure photometry and I infer a density. So I have on one end I have the density of the stars, and on the other one I have the vel total velocity. Of course, from this one I can go to the velocity expected from the stars, and from this one I can go back to the total 
density. So I can compare things either in the space of the velocities or of the densities, but once I know Newton, I can go from one space to the other, okay? So it's just a matter of convenience that I measure the velocities, the total rotation velocities, so I know the potential, and from the stellar photometry, I go to the velocity of the stars. Is that clear, or is it that confusing? I know how to go from one to the other, okay? But so if you want now, the problem is very simple because I have the total velocity and I have the one of the observed of the stars and this one is giving me the density of dark matter. There's a square because in general the velocity is equal to g m over r, which is not entirely true, of course. You have to solve the full equation. But since you're summing masses, the things are linear in the square velocity, okay? And obviously the way I go from the observed density of stars to the velocity of stars is not this one, but it is to uh, actually solve the equations this way, okay? <laughs> so the question that someone asked me, yeah, the rotation curve is not exactly 1 over the square root of the radius. Obviously, yes, it's true. I just solve fully the potential in all the parts, and then I project it in the plane because it is in the plane that I observe the rotation velocity. Okay? So, but let's get back. The point is that now the game I want to play is this one. I have the observed rotation curve, and I have the one that I expect from the stars. In order to fit it, I want to reconstruct the mass of dark matter. And I want to find the shape that best fits the fit between the data, the difference between the data. Okay? Don't forget that in the real data, this thing has error bars because I observe velocities, and this thing here that is shown as a line, this also has error bars. Okay? because this comes from an observation of the photometry of the stars that gives me the density. And then from the density, I go to the velocity. But the observation of the photometry has error bars. So this thing has error bars. So eventually, my practical problem will be this one. Good. Luminosity, I have something like this, which is the, the one expected by the luminous stars, and this one is the total. Okay, And now I want to find something that fits this gap, okay, that fills this gap. But I have to do it data by data. So what I do is I invent a function with several parameters, Every time I have a parameter, this is a function, and I see how well every time I fix one of the two parameters, I create something in between. So I basically fit an infinite number of functions, or it's not infinite, sampling the parameter space. So that's the way I choose the parameters. Okay? It's just a fit. So I sit in a multidimensional parameter space, I take alpha equal 1, Scale radius equal 20, the local dark matter is 0.3. I compute the function, I see how much is the chi-square. Store the chi-square, go on to the next step, etc., etc., etc. It's just a fit, okay? And eventually you get the number, okay? Uh, so let me show you the process. The process is this one, so it's spherical, I'm assuming spherical things. Uh, okay, so this was just the idea that the total gravitational potential is the is the sum of the three uh, visible components or not, and actually the answer is not, then I really have to go to the space of the data. There are tracers. The tracers are the ones that I measure, so there's a huge error bars. Okay, 20 minutes? Okay, good. So this is a, rea a realistic view, and this is a more realistic view with up-to-date. So you see how big the error bars are. Yes, Andresa. 
uh, this one. So, uh, first of all, these are all. So there is one important thing. This is a very good question. This well is here or here? This one. So the point is not that really, really there is a well. What worries me is that there is this up thing here. Okay. So one important thing when you do it practically is that you are making the assumption, which is well posed, that these tracers follow the gravitational potential, right? And on the top of it, they are on spherical orbits. The central 2.5 kiloparsec, there is a bulge of the Milky Way. The bulge is highly triaxial. There is a bar. So first of all, almost for sure, things are not on a circular orbit. So even if we're measuring something tangentially, it doesn't mean it's a circular orbit. Second thing, since stuff is in falling, it's almost sure, I mean, I wouldn't say it's sure, but it's highly doubtful whether they are following the gravitational potential or not. They might just be in falling in the opposite direction because of some strange thing that occurred for no locality. So what people typically do, they entirely neglect the data of the central 2.5 kiloparsec. Okay? And this is to be sure that you're not making a big mistake. On the other hand, in the central 2.5 kiloparsec, the po gravitational potential is not dominated by the dark matter. It's dominated by the stars. So it doesn't really matter if you include them in or not. So this is just to be safe. In fact, as you can see, this compilation that Miguel and I made in the central 2.5, there's very little data. They don't go up, as you can see, and, and then we basically cut the data out. We include the mass of the visible stars, but we don't perform the analysis. So the fit is not sensible to that. Okay. And then what you do is that you have to take the morphology of the stars and predict the rotation curve that you expect from the from the stars. This is very complicated because observing the stars it's non-trivial because we're not God that goes and picks the stars. You really have to perform observations of the velocity of the stars and their photometry. Also don't forget that the tracers of the total velocity are one type of observable, typical, typically gas clouds that move around. The observables for the stars to measure the stellar mass are different, are stellar populations standing there or moving very slowly. And the thing is that once you include all the uncertainties on how the bulge is shaped and so on and so forth, you have very different alternatives. So eventually it becomes a mess because you have several possible disks, several possible bulges. Yes? No, 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 they are not modeling, they fit the data. So. Yes, exactly. So it's analytical approximation of observations. They're not taken from simulation stars. It's completely observation driven. Okay? Completely. And the normalization comes from microlensing and the observational stars come from uh, parallaxes and stuff. But so the thing is that, I mean, now these many, many lines can get you confused. This is the rotation curve that you expect only from bulges. So blue is the different possible realization of bulges. Green is the possible realization of disks. Okay, the gas is really negligible. So what we do is that you can pick, for the moment, just pick your favorite disk and your favorite bulge. What we do is we combine every bulge with every disk and so on and so forth. So you have 70 alternative realizations. But it doesn't really matter for this purpose. What well, first is choose one, and then eventually you're getting something like this. So you have a central value and error bars. Now this is a little misleading, but you will have error bars in the predicted one. And then you have the observed data, and then you perform this fit. Okay, and once you perform the fit, you have to compute the chi-square. You can do it in one or two dimensions. This is not important, but what you typically do is this one. Okay, so you have the data, you have your possible more than one, one or two. You fit one of these profiles. Okay, that I was showing there. This is the exact formula, and then you recover the likelihood in the parameter space. So if I am sitting in the parameter space with rho naught 0.5 and uh, gamma or alpha 0.5, I get very, this is a very high region, so where the chi-square is something 0 1.1, 1.2, 1 so this region is very favored or not. So someone actually asked in terms of NFW, so 
this is almost an, an, a pure NFW because the parameters are the worst ones. There's a lot of things. This you can see how the different results scatter if I use a different bulge or a different disk, and this is scary because it means that we really don't know what the stars, what the visible component looks like. So, and in turns that affects how we don't know how the dark matter is distributed. This is some work that we are doing with Katya to actually, because right now you're you're saying, okay, I have a I have a system, I have an algorithm. And from that, I have two observables, and this tells me the number, okay? So it's like having a thermometer, go into a room and measure the temperature, and say the temperature is 25 degrees. This, is, this method is my thermometer. But then your thermometer might be off scale. Like you enter this room and you measure 100 degrees. You, if you haven't tested your thermometer, you don't know. So what we're doing with Katya is to test the system feeding a profile that we know. Right, we want to measure the accuracy and the precision of the instrument. And this is just an example, and then I give uh, to Katia for Dwarf Galaxies. What you can do if instead of wanting to fit a function, you are totally agnostic, okay? So you perform the exercise that I told you to, to, uh, to perform. I have V total square, I have V stellar square, I just make the assumption that the resulting function of the dark matter must be spherical. So I extract a function. And from the data, I extract this function without making any assumption on the shape. But in order to, to do that, I have to technically overbin the data. It's, it's complicated. And in fact, you can extract a profile without making any assumption about the fact that it's spherical. But the uncertainties are huge. So this is a typical NFW. And as you can see, it goes through the data but everything can go through those data, more or less. The only thing that doesn't go through those data is modified gravity. Okay? <laughs> so you can reconstruct the, the profile of the Milky Way, or the dark matter profile of the Milky Way with a certain degree of accuracy, but then in reality, your, your leading unknown is basically the fact that you really don't know the distribution of the visible stars which seems paradoxical because you see the stars and you would expect to know them, but that's not the case. Okay? And then once you have the profile, so you now you have, uh, you have the value of these indexes there, and you can perform if you're interested in the J-factor or if you, if you are interested in raw naught, so if you, know you want to know the local dark matter density, the spread is not big. You know it can be 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 GV per cubic centimeter, more or less. Are you happy with this? Are you happy with this? Okay. Katya, you want to talk about the dwarf galaxies? So, okay, let me talk about now about dwarf spheroidal galaxies and actually how can you use kinematics of, uh, of these galaxies to learn something about dark matter distribution. 
So first of all, I'm sure that you already heard about these galaxies, especially in terms of indirect dark matter searches. But just let me to remind you that uh, the, the dwarf galaxies are the, um, the galaxies that orbit around our own galaxy. So they're considered to be satellites of our galaxy. And uh, they are strongly dark matter dominated. And uh, so they just have few stars inside. So they do not have any star formation. So usually they're considered to be dead objects. And the total mass ranges in these, uh, between these values that is uh, much smaller than, for example, cluster of galaxies or even uh, our own galaxies. So smaller than spiral galaxies. So uh, since uh, even, even, even if, uh, as I said, there are a uh, few, few stars, but we still can uh, try to use them to, to, to get the information about uh, the total potential, even if, for example, themselves do not contribute to this potential. And so first of all, we assume that all stars are having the same mass, which is, of course, not true in reality, but, but for our purpose is more than enough and uh, that they are moving under the smooth gravitational potential and therefore they can be a good tracers of this, of this potential. So in order to, in order to describe the state of the system of, of stars, in this case the stars in these uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxies, you, you you use the so-called distribution function that as already Fabio showed here, is just a function that uh, in uh, six dimensional uh, phase space at a given time that uh, contains the three, uh, three parameters that comes from the position and the, the velocity, three, three components of the velocity. And uh, of course, if you take the integral of this function is something physical, and uh, the integral over all the possible velocities and you get the, the number density of stars. And in order to describe the evolution of this function, uh, one can use the so-called Boltzmann equation and in our case is the collisionless Boltzmann equation because the stars are in galaxies are collisionless. And uh, so then you can write the Boltzmann equation, then you, and uh, we also have to remember that our, our system is a, uh, Steady in the steady state, because uh, the, 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 the stars are collisionless, and therefore like the velocity, the mass is everything preserved. So we can write the, the Boltzmann equation in a steady state. Then we, we expand it for the um, partial derivatives. We know that the coordinate, uh, the, the derivative of coordinates with, res with the respect to time is the velocity, the velocity, the the derivative of the velocity with respect to time is the acceleration, which is basically the gradient of the, of the potential in a given conditions. That is a spherically symmetric system, of course. And of course, if you want to go to know more about the Boltzmann equation, you can go to this very interesting book and very important if you want to do astrophysics and uh, look for the details. So again, there are several solutions of this, uh, many solutions of this equation. And uh, uh, one, one of the ways we can try to take the so-called zero momentum is just to take integral of these, of these components over the velocities and get uh, the, the so-called Jeans equation. Uh, that for our systems, for dwarf spheroidal galaxies, this Jeans equation will be looking something like this, where uh, it connects, the, this is the number density of stars, this is the total potential, which we remember that in these galaxies, uh, the baryons, the stars are not so important, so do, do not contribute so much. So the total potential can be just taken from the dark matter, and which means that uh, it describes the, the underlying distribution of the matter, and, uh, and the kinematics, which is here is the dispersion velocity. So this equation is true, again, again for uh, taking into account several assumptions. First assumption is the system is in a steady state, then the system is isotropic, that means that uh, the velocity dispersion is equal in all the directions. So here, for example, it's the radial direction, but actually it's not important, so there is only one component of the velocity. And uh, generally speaking, for dwarf, not for all dwarf spheroidal galaxies it's true, but just to show you a, a simple example, I 
don't talk about it. So if, if it's not true, you will have uh, more, uh, more terms here. And then that we have a spherically symmetric system that is a good approximation for uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxies. And uh, so we, you then expand this and you get, uh, again, here you have the, uh, the number density of stars, the kinematics, and the uh, dark matter mass. This is uh, how you can write the gradient of the potential. And uh, in the spherically symmetric system, what is this uh, mass of the dark matter? It's just an integral of the density. And uh, here is something we do not know we want to learn about. And this is something we measure. And on the next slide, you will see what kind of measurements we can we do in order to get the information about this. And uh, of course, uh, this is some, some theory. In order to test your theory, you just put, uh, for example, an FW profile or whatever you want. And you just do what uh, Fabio was explaining here on the left hand side of the blackboard. And uh, you just fit. You do a simple fit. And uh, usually, the um, uh, the observations that you use for for uh, for uh, for dwarf spheroidal galaxies is the photometry. Is basically you you look at the light, and you from this uh, from the intensity of the light you can learn how many stars you have, and then you looking at the spectroscopy you can take you can measure the dispersion velocity. Not actually dispersion velocity, but line of sight that you can then. Uh, write down as a dispersion velocity. And here you see the dispersion velocity as the galactocentric radius. And it really looks like the, the rotation curve in spiral galaxies. But it's not, it's not it because uh, we do not have, it's uh, the, the dwarf spheroidal galaxies are pressure supported objects and not rotationally supported. And uh, to read about more about this kind of analysis, you, you can go to this, uh, to this work and uh, if you're interested. Basically, that's it. Any questions? Yes. Yes, actually, yeah. You you look at the stars as a fluid. You don't. Uh, yeah. You don't. Yeah. So. Yes, it's. I it's frankly not know how the dissipation will look like. It's it will be something super complicated. Yeah. Probably not. It's in order to go to the Jim's equations, we have to make some assumptions about the fact that the system is dynamically relaxed. And if you have viscosity, it's only dynamically relaxed. I'm not sure. But. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that the system will be in a steady state. You cannot say that the mass uh, at a given volume is preserved, for example. No, no, it's a collision effect. Yeah. There is, yeah. So this is actually the exercise I gave you for clusters of galaxies to show that they are collisionless. If we take the number and characteristics of a dwarf galaxy, we say the same thing. The stars are basically particles in a state of flux. <laughs> Someone else? Okay. Oh, in the <laughs> it depends. Because uh, as I was showing, if you since the J factor is the integral. is twice alpha. And the uncertainty on this one, given observable, it ranges, it scales from basically from 0 0.1 to a 1.5. We have a paper with, with, with Maria, my students, and other people, where we show that actually for the J factor in the galaxy center, if you want to be honest with the data and say, include all the uncertainties that come from the data, you range several orders of magnitude. 
people are adopted with that church by just people who say one of the numbers. So in reality, it's a honest to the way that you can dismember you can this number the whole of the church. I mean you can, but the uncertainties will be enormous. No, it's not, because uh, it's uh, the these measurements are very uncertain. So basically, and uh, here, for example, I assume that the velocity is, is isotropic, but actually you have three three components of the of the velocity, and uh, you can uh, measure only one. So you have to make assumption about other two. That is, uh, there are other kind of measurements that can you give can give you information about it, but it's super uncertain. Yeah. But just because we are CT and we want to really know what it looks like, if you were asking me whether any sort of this observation falls close to an MSW, I would say yes, without any doubt and without all the uncertainty in that. It's a different, the level of precision that I am requiring is because I want to be particle physics with it. So I want either uncertainty on draw naught or on the J factor, which is small because detect something, I want to have five sigma. But if you are asking me in an astrophysical way, the profile is known, yes, fantastic. Okay? So that is it. I would say that astrophysics is not really thing in terms of uncertainty. So as long as you have one case, they're happy. But uh, the thing is that the NSW is a test mass. It's not that the NSW is, th there is a fundamental difference in having general relativity or an NSW. It's, it's not a prediction, it's not a precise prediction. It's a test mass that is an emergent phenomena coming from the collapse of sphere. So it's a very good approximation. I go to astrophysics, I find that within the MR bars, the NSW is missing. That's okay. Then, if I wanna do a physics I want to fold that number in, I obviously don't take an NSW from the field of space because that's not the real data. But if you're asking me, do sim does the simulation look more or less like a reality? Yes, it does. And actually, complex simulations also show you that the image of the central part should vary depending on the mass of the baryons because that generates explosion of gas, explosion of gas reduces the gravitational potential on a time scale long of the chain. It's a self-consistent scenario. But if you're asking me if the number is at the, it's good at 10%, no. But the order one? For this analysis, you have to assume a, cer a certain uh, scalarity profile, right? Uh, you measure it, actually. For uh, dwarf galaxies? Or yeah. You In relative to dwarf galaxies? For, for, for the dwarf galaxies, you, you can measure it. I mean, you, you can kind of assume but it's a good, I mean, you always assume some power law, right? You have measurements and you have to fit it, but it's, it's quite a good, uh, good measure. For the, for the Milky Way, it's a different story. For the Milky Way, you also measure it. Let me be very clear. This part of this class is during the experimental week for a reason. The, the idea of how you perform it, it's simple, okay? It's clear. How you practically do it in each single case is a different matter. For the Milky Way, you have to measure the stellar profile, which is in principle very similar of having to measure the stellar profile in another galaxy, but it's technically extremely dif different. We do measure, and those different bars that I was showing you are from different measured stellar profiles. So it's all data-driven. And that's what he asked me before. It's not, it's not a modelization from a, a priori model. I take the observation, it looks three-dimensional, I invent an analytical formula that goes with it. I don't take it from any a priori, it's just that it must be analytical. I fit it to that data and I get error bars and I get parameters. But it's all data-driven, okay? And the uncertainties are big because I'm being honest to the data and I wanna do things with the data. Okay, 
in principle it's easy, in practice it's not a fact. And that's true for the Milky Way, it may not be true for another galaxy, although in principle they're similar. Okay, thank you. Good. Ih, foi mal, agora já era, agora já era. Estou assim, desse lado, assim? Amanhã estava lá fora.